So today on the touchdown, we talk all things cricket, but most importantly, we talk all things women's cricket in South Africa. And of course, we've got a lady that has played a lot of her cricket in the Northwest for at least seven years. And most importantly, she's the lady who's got a very safe pair of hands. She's the wicket keeper, of course, for the Proteas. And her name is Sinalo Jafta. Sinalo, how are you doing today? I'm very good. How are you doing today, Aaron? I'm doing very, very well. I love the fact that I now get to focus so much more on women in sports. And now we chat all things cricket. I love cricket, but I've always wondered about the ladies game now. And I'm so happy to have this opportunity to chat with you, Sinalo. Sinalo, I would love to get straight into it. Big question as to how did you fall in love with the sport of cricket? And tell us a little bit more about your upbringing. Uh, so basically, let's, okay, two phases. So let's start with my upbringing. So obviously, like I was raised by a single mother. Um, but, which is funny, I was in hostel from six years old all the way to matric. So from grade two all the way to matric, I was in hostel. So it was kind of like a, okay, I'm raised by a single mother, but actually like the, the, the hostel staff was kind of like the one that kind of like grew me, if you want to put it that way. So it was always a school system. So Falling in love with cricket, you know, in the boys, like during like um, homework, you have that hour gap and then all the boys go one way, all the girls go one way. But I was always stuck in the middle because I knew they were going to go to play like rounders or touchies or whatever. So I was like, nope, I'm going to on the like sports field, whatever we're doing that day. And for me, it was more like a love of sport rather than a love for cricket at first. Oh, that's absolutely beautiful. I'd love to talk a little bit about your mother, a single mother. How important was her role in terms of supporting you as a young lady, but also supporting your cricket career? Um, So basically, there's always a stigma in our culture that you kind of have to study and you're going to make it big. If you study, you're guaranteed to make it big. So for me, coming across and saying, no, I don't, uh, yes, I'm not, I'm book smart, but I'm also, (laughs) I hate books. Like, I really, like, I'm not a fan. So for me, my outlet was always like, okay, I do my homework, but I know, like, okay, the reward is going out on the cricket field, hockey field, whatever it was. So I work hard for, like, that hour, hour and a half, and I work harder for three hours on the sports field. So for me, it was always like, okay, sports is where I'm going. But obviously, like, as a parent, like, you don't want to support that because maybe your child will fail. So I don't think my mom was like accepting or supportive at the beginning. And I think once she saw like the growth and where where sport was taking me, she kind of said, okay, it's pretty wing. And at what, at what age was that? Because I'm sure at some time she literally had to let go and say, listen, my daughter absolutely loves sports. I need to accept it. Um, yo, I can't even go specifically because I remember in high school, uh, she got called in by like the, great pop head to say listen she kind of has to focus if she wants to carry on and then my mom was like okay i'll speak to her and then i kind of got back to my senses so i did that then i went to the northwest university Puka. when i got there it was more for hockey than anything because i was supposed to finish cricket in a trick so hockey gave me a full bursary so my mom was like okay fine you can play because you don't have another choice you're going to university to play hockey and then from there it was more like she was still not accepting she said i want the degree i want your honors i want everything and i was like oh why and then i think when i was 21 so third year she was like okay i give up you do you like go for it oh and that's absolutely amazing because it's so important to just have your your parents give you the go ahead. I know it's not always their decision, but it just, it it just almost settles you in to say that I'm so happy that my mother supports me. I love what you mentioned there with regards to the hockey. Now I know that you are very focused and dedicated and hockey to a certain extent was the dream. How did the shift happen from hockey to cricket? Uh, It's funny because I've played hockey from grade two. So I was seven years old and I only played cricket in grade eight. So it's like six years old, 14 years old, or 13 years old. You know, huh? So for me, the shift happened, like you actually spoke about Nicole Warraven. Uh, we actually made the SA under 16 together. Like, you know, like the, we all grew up together playing against each other. Free State Border was like the ideal game. Um, 
So for me, matric year, I was like, okay, cricket, I'm done. Because by then, I didn't make any SA schools. So I was like, okay, it's written in stars. I have to play hockey. Um, there's no going back. And I remember um, IPT for hockey was in June. And then cricket week was in December. So I already signed with Northwest saying, okay, I'm committed, I'm going. And then I remember first week of December is like the cricket uh, week. Like any other week, I just go out there, wicked keeper, a bat top four. Oh well, and then later that week, I was the SA under nineteen captain, and I'm like, oh, oh, you understand? So it was like, okay, hectic. And then I got a Northwest, but I didn't tell Northwest I was gonna be there because I was adamant that I'm done playing cricket. And then one of the um, guys in the office was coaching. Poch Gymnasium, um, Poch Gym. And it's like, your name looks familiar on this university uh, list. I was like, uh, no, so I don't know what you're talking about. And it was actually wearing a floppy. So I was like, nope, nope, he's trying to drag me. <laughs> and then um, Warren Basil was like, okay, come to the stadium. I'll introduce you to the coach. And then from there, <laughs> game over. Oh, that's absolutely amazing. It's always good to almost find yourself in, in the sporting world because you mentioned that your first love is sports, making that transition to cricket from hockey, actually. And I love what you mentioned with regards to Nicole Erasmus. We spoke to her last week on the touchdown as well. And one of the most amazing things that I'm now starting to realize is how passionate ladies are in the sporting world but not just that the fact that they in their very own right can compete with men at the very same level and we should always give respect where respect is due i mean looking at 2019 that was an absolutely fantastic year for women in sports in south africa i mean you look at the pro tiers um, ladies in liverpool at the netball world cup where they played so well finishing off in the semi-finals you look at banyana banyana qualifying for their first fifa women's world cup in france towards um june roundabout and and then, of course, just this year in February, we saw the Pro Tiers women's team as well playing the semifinals in Australia. In your perspective, how is the landscape of women's sports looking in South Africa? Um, for me, it's, it's growing. Like, uh, it's, it's amazing. And, I mean, you forgot to mention that the ladies actually are going to the Olympics. So, for me, um, it's mind-blowing of what you would have said three years ago and what you're going to say now it's like two different things and i feel like it's just it's, it was never that women were terrible in sport it's just that i think it's a mental shift everything is a mental shift you're like oh okay let's actually do this and let's it's more like of a passion and the love because you don't expect anything back you just do it because you love it Oh, that's absolutely beautiful. And what is one of those things that you absolutely love about sports? Because I think a big part of professional sports these days is traveling the world. And I know recently you went to India. How was that experience? Um, firstly, we all know India is number one in cricket. Um, when it comes to supporting, no matter what cricket it is, it is massive. So imagine going from playing in South Africa, we the fans or the crowd is basically your friends, your family, um, maybe school kids here and there. Like, let's say on average, it's like 100 people or less. You go to India, you have 20,000 fans. So you can actually... <laughs> and the game is rained out. So they're still waiting and expecting us to actually go out there and play. So out of the eight ODI, eight T20s, I think they rescheduled like most of them. Um, and I only got to play the last one. And I mean, for me, I went like, like, I, uh, like I was scared. Yeah. I remember I spoke to my agent before and I was like, yep. <laughs> you know, like when you're like, okay, who's like the Zen? And then I think once I went over the boundary, I was like, okay, it's game on. This is what I'm meant to do. And before oh. that, it was, it, I wasn't on the contract yet. So it was more like my love. It wasn't more like, okay, this is what my, what my job is. So then when I came back, I got the contract and I was like, okay, it just got real. It's, this is my job. 
Oh, that's absolutely amazing. And I love that you mentioned that this is your job, but also one of the great things about sports is on-field banter. And always as you're traveling from one point to another, as you're traveling in a bus possibly, I love the fact that in every single cricket team, there's usually in the bus at least three individuals that you can always point out. You've got the singer, the one that always sings the loudest, and you've got the silent assassin, the person who usually sits quietly or maybe sits at the back just minding their own business with the earphones in and then of course you've got the joker the person who's almost making most of the jokes making most of the fun looking at your okay. team who would you identify as the singer the <laughs> joker and the silent assassin and maybe you're one of them as well no okay so i'll go singers i'll go sune blues she likes singing sometimes um do me sukukune Oh, lefty. Oh, yeah, lefty. And then I'll go Silent Assassins. Um, Laura Volfort has to be one. Ayabonga Kaka has to be the other one. Um, he said the Joker. I'll go Chloe Tryon. <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah. Oh, nice, nice. Never a dull moment in a cricket team, hey? And of course, one of the yeah. most important things about cricket is the on-field banter and I know that you're a wicket keeper and some would actually argue that that's the best place on the field to enjoy the on-field banter between the slips and the wicket keeper that's where you can chirp the batsman a little bit when your fast bowler is bowling at a blistering rate in your in your opinion where is the best place for you to enjoy on-field banter on a cricket field <laughs> you it's a tough one because I know um Danefani Kerk likes to get in your ear um, when I've played with her. Uh, she loves getting into your ear. Um, we more of like, how do I put it? We more of, we don't really chirp that much, but we actually do. But for me, uh, my, my strategy, I have conversations with the batters so that I can't, no, it's not like, or oh, like the typical chirps. I know like the Australian captain, the wicket keeper, he's bad. He chirped at the ashes so bad. Like I was watching, like I was listening to him on mic, trying to get tips. And I'm like, I can't say that. But I'm more like, so how's your day going? Just to get your mind to like, oh, this wicket keeper's nice. But actually, I'm just trying to get you off your game just a little bit. Um, I'll whistle here and there. Like, you know, just to irritate you. It's like, Zzz. That be, but I'd say a mid wicket, extra cover, slips and keeper, best place. Nice, nice. Classic on-field banter, hey? And of course, looking at your career thus far, I'm certain with all of the uh, wonderful things that you've been able to achieve thus far, what is one of those key moments that really stands out for you? Doesn't necessarily have to be you winning a particular trophy, but just one of those moments that you were able to just pat yourself on the back and say, you know what? That was a truly special moment. Um, I think for me, because since I'm still so new into the team, um, I've only played 13 internationals. Um, I think for me, the the mental switch and the moment where I was like, oh, hang on, I actually deserve to be here was um, against Pakistan um, around this time last year, actually, because we were 2-1 down in the T20 and it was a must win T20 and out of the five. And I remember going in needing a runner ball but anyone can say, okay, that's easy. But imagine, I just made my debut three games ago. No, two games ago. This is... Ugh. So obviously, like, let's be honest. Like, I wouldn't trust myself either. Like, imagine if I was standing in the stand and I'm like, oh, no, here's another junior. But it's amazing how in provincial you can probably do it because you're so much more calm. But it's international. It's no longer that... Your province, your country depends on you. People are watching or following the game live. So they're like, oh, Jafta's in. Okay, she has good stats in provincial, but not in international. So for me, my mind thing was like, I have to do this for the team. And I remember going in and Chloe Tryon was in and she's like, okay, bud, get me on strike. I was like, 100%. <laughs> it was like more like going back to backyard cricket, tip and run. I was like, okay, cool. And then the first one was a dot. And I was like, <laughs> Don't do this to me. And then I remember one was just um, outside off, and I actually cut it um, between backward 
point and short uh, third, and it went for four. I was like, that's my first boundary for international cricket. Like, it's weird. And then Chloe went out, and then Shabim Ishmael came in. And the way she came in, she was smiling. And I was like, oh, cool. You're smiling now? Like, this is someone that's played international cricket more than 10 years. And she comes in there smiling, and I'm like, okay, I'm definitely giving you strike. Yep. So we ran two, got a one, and then she, like, we needed, I think, uh, two from four. And then she hit a six. I was like, okay, cool. Then for me, that's, like, where everything changed, like, my mindset. That's where everything changed. It's like, okay, I can actually contribute to my team. And that was, like, my first nod out for the team. So it was really crucial for me. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. And I think that's a moment that you will cherish for the rest of your career, just to be able to survive to, to survive that moment as well. And then looking at women's cricket in South Africa, I think looking at the wonderful performance that the ladies displayed in Australia recently towards the end of February, how do you think women's cricket in South Africa is developing and also the good platform that the ladies are now building for younger ladies to actually take on the baton and say, you know what, I want to play, I want to play cricket because the ladies are doing so well. Yeah, um, so I'm part of the Western Province uh, women's cricket team and it's amazing now because usually I'd go with Coach Claire to one of these practices like under 16s or under 19s and I was actually lucky enough to be one of like the coaches for like a trial process, like trials, so you get given a team and it's amazing how kids from different backgrounds, some from townships, some from good schools and like Cricket just joins everyone, whether you like it or not. Uh, when the bowler comes, you're not thinking of, oh, this person's from there. You're just worried about the ball. And I just love what cricket is doing that from that aspect of just bringing people together. And kids are actually being more like, they're more interested in cricket. And I remember, like, us as um, provincial players, we have to play club cricket. And every Sunday or Saturday when you're there, the kids are like, and you're like, I'm just a person. I um, it's just there's more recognition and the kids are starting to know you more whereas if I'm being honest with you if you asked me who this player was when I was their age I wouldn't be able to answer you so it was just yeah oh, that's it's absolutely amazing that's true and I mean the amazing cricket that that is now being played by ladies actually builds a good platform for a lot of those young girls to now aspire to be a, a future pro tier and they will definitely um, make it into those teams and then of course looking at the current situation and the landscape of our country at the moment and globally as well as we continue to combat the COVID-19 pandemic and everybody in this time is finding their own way of staying sane and just being able to go about day-to-day -day life I mean, how has COVID-19 changed your, your life for the better? I mean, a lot of us are now more efficient with technology, I have to admit. And also, what are some of the things that you and your teammates are doing to just keep the banter flowing amongst you? Because we all know how much South Africans love their memes. Okay, so let's just say from the beginning of lockdown I was, or quarantine, I was very motivated very motivated i was like okay it's just 21 days hey let's go and then uh president extended again let, let me tell you i just shaved all my hair off I was like, okay fresh start let's go um <laughs> so two weeks in i was like motivated then that's seven days i was like extension and then i think on the 28th i was like okay hair has to go and then yeah um <laughs> it's tested me mentally i won't lie to you uh you think you're mentally strong until you stuck there's a difference between i've always loved indoors but i knew my outlet was always going on the cricket pitch or yes now we can run but it's not the same like for me motivation shift has changed so i'm just if you can organize it i just want to touch a cricket pitch and then i'll come back home like, that's all I want. That's like my wish. That's my wish. Just to touch it. Like, just go. Then I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm done. But like, I feel like it's, it's really challenged me mentally. And 
we all need mental strength to grow your game. And I feel like it's, I've, I'm not ashamed to say that I've actually been speaking to a psychologist and I feel like it's okay. Um, and it's just something that you have to get used to. And I feel like some people were like, okay, I feel like I'm, I'm going through, don't be afraid to see someone because that's maybe like an inner voice that you have to get out of your head immediately. And from training, like I told you, I was so motivated. And then like now three, like four, five, and ten, I was like, oh, what now? And then that's when I actually spoke to someone. Um, and I went like, he's helped a lot. Um, and he kind of gave me like a fresh perspective of how to take on things. And training regimes within the team, um, we actually get programs from our trainer, uh, Russell Clark. So he's been really efficient in that. and just. Yeah. So what else can you do besides just taking it hands on, just facing it? Yeah, that is very true. And I love the fact that you're so open and honest about it because I think sometimes one of the most important things, and I mean, everybody's going through a little bit of a challenging time, just for you to take care of your mental health is incredibly important during this time. And of course, we have seen the president announce that level three will be implemented on the 1st of June and hopefully before we all know it, this thing will be something that will be forgotten and we'll focus again and we'll see you back out mm -hmm. on your home ground, if I can call it that, the cricket field, where you really enjoy expressing yourself as well. Yeah. And then looking forward towards your career post COVID-19. And of course, once you get back on the cricket field, what are some of the things that you would love to still achieve in your career with so many years that are still lying ahead of you? Um, I think everyone, as a wicket keeper better, uh, I'd love to score 100 or I'd love to contribute to a team. But for me, the thing is, is just going out there and doing the best for my team, whether I make uh, 23 not out, but it's like a crucial 23 not out or uh, score 100. So my thing is, I'm just focused on just contributing to the team, catching that blinder that no one thought that you'd catch and just staying in it um, and keeping things simple. Uh, I think we so focused on oh, I have to listen this and get to just focus on the basics and keep it simple. Oh, um, and yeah, I want to play for the next hopefully 10 years of international cricket if my body allows. Um, and I just want <clears throat> to enjoy it. Enjoy the moment because you know, you're not, you don't know when it's going to be taken away. So. That's very, very true. And I love the fact that you say keep it basic. And for every single athlete and every single person who performs at an incredibly high level, they usually have something that drives them, something that keeps them going, a quote or a saying or a message from somebody that has really impacted their lives, something that stands by them. Is there anything that you maybe repeatedly say to yourself or a quote that you read every single morning that just keeps you driven during the difficult um, patches of your career? Um, I think it, it would have to be like, I don't have, I do have quotes, but I don't have one to think directly of my head. I've got like a couple, like, uh, like the night before every game or whatever, I have a rhythm where I just pump myself in motivational videos. Like, you know, that thing of like, yeah, the morning, like, yeah, like the usual, like, yeah, but I think for me, the one thing that keeps me sane is my little brother. So he's 13 years old, so it's like a 12-year gap. I don't know what my mom was thinking. But um, just to see him, like, happy, um, like, every time I give him, like, a shirt, or he's, he's useless in cricket. Oh, He's a rugby player. So for me, I can't even teach him and take him to the net because he's so bad. And I was like, boy, stick to your rugby. Like, I'll support your rugby every day. You play your center position. Good. But I think for me, it's just him. And, like, just seeing the excitement every time I come home. And, like, if I don't make the team, he's, like, the first one to, like, it's okay, you'll make the next one. So I think for me, like, that one person that no matter if I make the team or I don't make the team or I'm injured or whatever, he's always going to be proud no matter what. Um, so he can be sane and going. Oh. That's absolutely amazing. Your younger brother keeping you motivated and almost supporting you through some of those rough patches as well. Sinalo Jafta, I'd really like to thank you so much for your time. I think most importantly, some of the amazing work that you're doing on and off the field to inspire young ladies in the world of sport. And of course, lastly, I would just simply like to ask you if there was a young lady 
that was listening to your voice right now that is thinking about going professional in sports that is torn into almost that should I actually go into sports am I as good as my older brother who maybe plays rugby does woman do women in sports matter what message would you give to that young lady right now firstly breathe um get through i'm a firm believer in education but even though i didn't like it so firstly breathe stick to the discipline of your books um there's nothing more than not getting enough marks to go to university you want to go to university um if not then just finish just finish high school and then from there i think just take away all like the take the criticism you get from people uh, but in a positive way, um, if someone tells you you can't do it, just smile and like, okay, cool. Thank you. I've heard it before. And obviously you will get that one person that will believe in you. Stick with those people, stick with that person. Cause that's the one person that's going to keep you motivated throughout your career. Um, if it's a coach, go for, like trust in them cause they know what they're doing. Cause we all had that one coach that kind of helped us to the next level. Um, if your parents don't agree with it, um, don't argue with them. Accept it. Because once you argue, it gives them reason to take it away. So just accept it, smile and wave. But what it, when you get the chance to go play whatever sport it is, give it 150% because you know going back home, they're not going to accept it. It's just you always have to work that much harder for them to actually start believing. So I think it's just a model of don't give up. No matter what you do, if you give up, it just means that you're taking 10 steps back. Oh, wow. That's absolutely amazing. Sinalo Jafta, a lady who is most certainly paving the way for future cricketers and most importantly, women in cricket as well. Thank you so much for your time. We really do appreciate it. But I think most importantly, thank you so much for being such a great and incredible role model for young ladies in the sporting world. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you. Cheers. Okay, bye-bye.